In this video, I'm going to be talking about deviations from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, in particular, how you can use deviations from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to provide information about possibly what kinds of natural selection are occurring. So, as mentioned in previous videos, an interesting fact about allele frequencies is if all evolutionary forces were to stop, allele frequencies will stay constant and genotype frequencies will stay constant from generation to generation. And this situation is called Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So normally we can't monitor allele frequencies over time, but we can go into a population, sample the allele frequencies, and it turns out that if we plug in our observed genotype frequencies and calculate out allele frequencies and then plug those, those allele frequencies into the Hardy-Weinberg equation, we can compare predictions of genotype frequencies against the observed genotype frequencies. And that comparison can indicate, first, whether the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And second, if it's not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we can look for clues as to what type of evolutionary processes are actually happening. So that means the deviations from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium can be used as clues to understand evolutionary processes. So we can go take a sample of individuals from a population, determine allele frequencies, plug those allele frequencies into the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation, and we can use the results of that to help us understand if and what type of evolution is happening. So for this example, we're going to be using sickle cell anemia. We'll be saying there's a big gene S and two alleles, big S and little s. Big S, big S individuals, homozygous dominant individuals produce uh, normal red blood cells but are susceptible to malaria, homozygotes. Uh, excuse me, heterozygotes, big S, little s, they are resistant to malaria, which is believed to be beneficial. And then little s, little s individuals, homozygous recessives, they are susceptible to, um, or they are susceptible to having sickle cell anemia, debilitating disease. Shouldn't say susceptible. They they pretty much almost always have. I think they get uh, sickle cell anemia. So we're going to say we went into a population. We took blood samples and determined the genotype of of uh, 200 individuals and 75 were homozygous dominants. They had normal red blood cells, big S, big S. Uh, 115 had uh, heter were heterozygotes and 10 were little less, little less uh, individuals with sickle cell anemia. So we can look at these genotype frequencies and we can break them down to determine the frequencies of the alleles. So if we have 75 big S, big S individuals, they are all 2N. So in a theoretical gene pool, they would each contribute one big S allele, um, or rather two big S alleles. So 75 individuals, diploid 2N, 75 times two is 150 big S alleles contributed to our theoretical gene pool. 115 big S, little s heterozygotes, they're all 2N, so they're going to contribute to our theoretical gene pool, 115 big S alleles and 115 little s alleles. Same logic applies to our little s, little s, um, this should say homozygotes, there are 10 uh, little s, little s homozygous recessives, they're 2N, so 10 times 2 is 20 little s alleles. So our homozygous dominants just contribute big S, heterozygotes contribute big S and little s alleles, and homozygous recessives they contribute just little s's. So I encourage you to pause the video here and see if you can calculate out the frequency of the big S and little s allele. Whenever I do this, I always try to be really uh, painfully obvious in, of my calculations. So I make sure there's 200 individuals here. Those 200 individuals are diploid. So there's 400 total chromosomes or 400 total gametes in my theoretical gene pool. So then I check and make sure that the number of alleles that I've recorded here adds up. So 115 plus 150 is 265, 115 plus 20 is 135, 265 plus 135 um, equals 400. So I've kept track of all of my alleles. Then I can divide these totals to calculate out the frequency of the S alleles, the big S and the little s alleles. So 265 divided by 400 is 0 0.66 and 135 
divided by um, 400 is going to equal 0 0.34. I always checked, make sure those add up to 100, or excuse me, a frequency of one or the same as 100%. So we have now have observed allele frequencies and we can plug those into the Hardy-Weinberg equation, which would um, allow us to formulate uh, expectations about what we would expect the genotype frequencies to be. And we can compare the actually observed genotype frequencies to those predicted using our allele frequencies. And that will tell us about um, whether the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and whether um, what type of evolutionary force might be occurring. So we have observed genotypes, we get our observed allele frequencies like we have here, and then we can predict the frequency of each uh, genotype. So using just the allele frequencies, Hardy-Weinberg equation tells us we can predict what the genotype frequencies would be under Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. We use P to represent the frequency of big S, Q to represent the frequency of little s. Always make sure you know how in any given scenario um, P and Q are being defined. We know that the frequency under Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium of the homozygous dominant is P squared. Uh, the frequency of the heterozygote is 2 times P times Q, and the, the frequency of the homozygous recessive is Q squared. So we can plug our values of P and Q into that, and we get the following frequencies. For these, I always check and make sure they add up to 1. And then uh, once I've checked my math, what I do is I multiply each one of these frequencies. These are predicted genotype frequencies if the population was in Hardy, under Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. I, I multiply each one of those frequencies by 200, which is my original population size. And this gives me the expected genotype frequencies, or the expected genotype numbers if the population was in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So I start with my original observed genotype frequencies. I calculate out the observed allele frequencies. The Hardy-Weinberg equation tells me that if these, if the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, then these allele frequencies can be plugged into the equations and they will give me the um, genotype frequencies. So I can multiply these frequencies by the observed population size and I get what are expected genotype uh, numbers if the population was in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. There's a little bit of rounding error going on here. This is not actually 0 0.44. It's a little bit smaller. Um, but 0 0.44 times 200 is about 88. 0 0.45 is about 90. 0 0.11 is about 22. I always check. I should add these up. It should be about 200 plus or minus a little bit of rounding error. So I now have expected numbers of each genotype under Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So then what I'm going to do is compare these expected number of genotypes under Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium against the actual observed number. So here's a summary table. I've got my allele frequencies from the observed genotypes. This is my math here showing my frequencies. This is the expected frequency or the predicted frequency of these genotypes if the population was in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Multiply each one of these by 200. These are my expected number under Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And then I can compare the expected or the predicted if the population was in equilibrium to the observed number, the actual ones that we uh, saw in the population or in the sample rather, where we got these original allele frequencies from. And we can see that there are, we expected about 88 homozygous dominants, big S, big S, but we only observed 75 in our original sample. So 87 minus 75 is 12. So that actually there is a deficit. The, the real sample is deficient in heterozygotes. Similarly, we predicted about 22 homozygous recessives using the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. We expect or predict about 22 or 23, but we only observed 10, so another a difference of about 12 or 13. So again, there's a deficit or deficiency in the number of heterozygotes. You can probably see where this is going if we're lacking in the number of, heter of homozygotes, rather. We, we're, we're 
deficient in homozygous dominants and deficient in homozygous recessives. If we're deficient in them, we have to have an excess of heterozygotes. So the hard, under Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we would expect about 90 heterozygotes. But actually, in our real observed sample, there were 115. So there is an excess of 25 or 26 heterozygotes. So there is an heterozygote excess. So again, there are fewer big S, big S in the real population. There are more big S, little s in the real population than predicted. And there are fewer little s, little s. So we would say there is a deficiency of homozygotes. And there is an excess of heterozygotes. And first of all, the numbers, if the population was in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we would expect that the expected number and the observed number would be closer to each other. We're not going to do any statistical tests, but they, we would expect them to be um, much closer than this, much more consistent. So first of all, we know we are not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, or not likely to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And then second, we can say there is an excess of heterozygotes. So this, there perhaps is natural selection operating, and that there is a heterozygote advantage. Now, this matches with the natural history of, of um, sickle cell anemia, where we know that big S, little s heterozygotes are resistant to malaria, but also do not have symptoms of sickle cell anemia. So we have reason to believe that they have higher fitness than either those who produce normal blood that but are susceptible to um, susceptible to malaria or those who are have sickle cell anemia. And this is bearing out in our sample where we have more heterozygotes over than expected.